You know, when I started my first office job almost 30 years ago, information technology and business productivity was very different. It was the start of the 90s. Mobile phones were rare, text messaging was new, and the internet, well, that was a loud screeching noise that came from the finance director's office. As I sat at my new desk in my ill-fitting suit, I can remember pulling a floppy disk from my pocket so that I could load the applications I'd brought from home. The trouble was, what sat in front of me was a sad little box with a silly green screen. Nothing like the 386 powerhouse that sat in my bedroom. It had no disk or GUI, it was just a simple keyboard to input the data and a screen to view the output. And that wasn't uncommon. Back then, companies would run dumb terminals that would connect back to a central mainframe over a simple serial cable connection. In the two or three years that followed, the terminals and mainframe were slowly replaced with desktop PCs running the new Windows for Workgroups operating system. And suddenly, users could share resources without the need for a centralized server, and a paradigm shift occurred. Impersonal become personal. But that became an administration headache. How did we keep the PCs patched? How did we control what software was installed? And how did we ensure consistency? Now jump forward to today. Computers, smartphones, and tablets have saturated the market, going from the desktop to a remote anywhere and everywhere approach. Users want to combine their personal computing experiences with business productivity solutions that empower them to enjoy the best of both worlds. But again, this can prove problematic for resource administration, especially when we must now draw a fine line between what is business and what is personal. Thankfully, global connectivity, backed by the power of the cloud, has enabled us to come full circle. And again, we are beginning to see a paradigm shift in productivity with the return of centralized computing through services such as Windows Virtual Desktop. In this video series, I'm delighted to be joined by Microsoft Cloud Solution Architect and WVD Specialist, George Wood, as we walk through the installation, configuration, and ongoing management of a WVD deployment. It's our hope that these small and bite-sized videos will provide you with the knowledge and confidence that you'll need to begin evaluating your own virtual desktop solution. George, welcome. Thanks, Dan. It's always great to hear stories about how IT used to function. Being younger than you, my experience was very different. When I started my IT career, companies were already using virtualization and the internet was commonplace. Back then, we were using technology such as AppV and RDS to help control the delivery of end user experiences. But that in itself came with its own challenges. If we jump forward to today, services such as Windows Virtual Desktop run on top of the Microsoft Cloud. This empowers companies to run rich, multi-session environments and diverse workloads with full desktops or singular applications. Thanks, George. So what are we going to cover in our first video? So in this video, we'll set up the underlying infrastructure and get the service installed. This will all be driven from the Azure portal. To begin with, we'll need to think about our identity strategy. And as always, you'll have options. So basically, there are three main strategies. You can spin up a domain controller in Azure, you could use a service such as Azure Active Directory Domain Services, or you could connect to an existing domain controller on-premises. And each one of these will come with their own pros and cons. You run a DC in the cloud, and you can control the running of the service, but at the detriment of additional management responsibility. You run a service such as Azure AD DS, and you'll reduce management, but will add complexity for hybrid environments. Finally, you connect back to an on-premises DC, you'll gain hybrid connectivity, but this can potentially add latency. Now, because we want to be in full control of our demo environment, we will opt to build a small DC in our sandbox. George, can you walk us through it? Sure. So the first thing we'll do is build our domain controller, and that will act as the root of our identity solution. I will place it inside a new resource group and name the virtual machine WVD DC. Once built, we need to connect into the virtual machine and install and configure Active Directory domain services. I will do this for a new forest named goasure.it and then begin the AD Connect wizard. This will allow identity synchronization between our domain controller and Azure AD. With synchronization complete, 
we can go ahead and begin populating our directory with the accounts that we would need later in the demo. This would include an account to join machines into the domain, a group for our WVD users, and the accounts needed to consume the service. With that done, we can now begin configuring WVD. But before we do, let's just take a little time to understand the service architecture. Now, as we've just covered, WVD will need some kind of identity service, but it's from here that we really begin to see it distinguish itself from the solutions that we may have configured in the past. And what I mean by this is that Microsoft have taken on a larger role of managing certain aspects of the environment. For example, things like load balancing, session brokering, and diagnostics. But that doesn't mean that Microsoft manages everything. So let me hand back to George, who will explain more. Thanks, Dan. So let's begin with the host pool. A host pool is simply a collection of machines that register to Windows Virtual Desktop as session hosts. And these should all be sourced from the same image to ensure a consistent user experience. These could be from the marketplace or indeed your own golden image. Next, we need to think about an app group. And as you can probably guess, these are logical groupings of applications or desktops within a session host. Finally, each application group will need to be associated with a workspace so that our end users can see the resources published. It's worth reminding our viewers that what we're building here is a native WVD solution. But do bear in mind that we also have great partnerships with the likes of Citrix. In fact, if you're looking to leverage that partnership, we've recently been joined by Toby Brown to record a session, which can be found by following the URL on screen. OK, George, what's next? So let's begin by creating a workspace. I'll select our resource group, provide both a name and friendly name, before adding a short description and selecting a location. It's also worth noting that at this point, you can register any existing application groups with the workspace. We haven't created those yet, so I'll add my tags and press Create. Next, we will configure our host pool. Again, I will provide a simple name, location, and resource group before selecting a pool type, session limit, and load balancing algorithm. And just to clarify, the way we configure the host pool type can offer companies a real significant advantage over resource consumption. Personal pools will offer a one-to-one -one mapping, and this may be desired in scenarios whereby you need to ensure a specific build or configuration. However, companies may find a significant cost reduction in having many users utilize a single larger VM instance. And this is made possible today with services such as Windows 10 multi-session, which is only available on Azure. So George, can you tell me a little more about the load balancing algorithm and what choices we have for our pooled sessions? So we basically have two options, breadth and depth. Breadth will distribute new sessions across all available hosts, while depth will distribute sessions to the host with the highest number of connections if it hasn't reached its maximum session limit. So with that, let's complete our host pool by adding some virtual machines. Again, I will add our location, name, and quantity, in addition to specifying the Windows 10 multi-session image to be used. Notice that I'm also referencing the identity that we created earlier to join the virtual machine to the domain before we go ahead and add the images to our workspace. Finally, I will add our tags and begin deployment. So with a host pool created, we can begin assigning users to our application groups. And these can be one of two types, either a full-blown desktop experience or a remote application. Whichever one we choose, we'll need to assign users from the identity service that we created earlier. And it's important to mention that these accounts must be synced via AD Connect. In this instance, we'll pick Joe Blogs. Let's test our setup and ensure that we can connect. Now, initially, I'll be connecting through an HTML5 browser. This means that it could be my tablet, laptop, phone, or really any internet connected device. Notice that I have a full desktop experience and because of the image, the full suite of Office applications. And the experience is persistent. What I do in one session is available in the next. Take this example. Look what happens when I use the remote desktop client. As you can see, my data is still available. So let's wrap this up. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, this is the first of a series of bite-sized videos. Now that we have our underlying service configured, we can begin to tweak and optimize our solution. We're going to introduce services such as FS Logix, set up remote applications, configure teams optimization, and much, much more. And we want you to get involved. 
We have a wealth of resources available for you to begin connecting, learning, and deploying your own service. This will give you the confidence you need and help you understand the true potential of desktop as a service. With that, both George and I thank you for your time and look forward to welcoming you back to the next session.